All right. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to what I like to call Metaverse 101. And so I know a lot of people have seen in the news, on TV, social media, what is the metaverse? And you think you're being left behind. Well, I just want to reassure you that you're not. And so I'll get into explaining a little bit about what the metaverse is, why you should care, and why big corporations are getting in now. And that's why I don't want you to get left behind. So I want you to pay attention, pull out your notebooks, pull out your pen, your piece of paper, whatever you need to do, because I want you to get started today uh, in the metaverse. So let's get started. So now you're probably here because you're like, all right, what is the metaverse? You don't know what it is. If that's you, that's okay. If you are the person who had missed the boat on Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and you don't want to miss out here, uh, congratulations, you're in the right place. Or maybe even you have a vision for your business. You kind of have some ideas of what you want to do, but you need a plan. Congratulations, you're in the right place. And so I think that it's really important that you're here today, but let me share why you should listen to me and who I am. Hi, my name is Bianca Jackson, and I am a Pulitzer Prize winning IT project manager. Uh, you know, I managed a team at USA Today where we built a, a metaverse project or product, I should say, that won a Pulitzer. I used to work for Marriott, United Health Group, and a whole host of other Fortune 1000 companies within the Washington, D.C. area. Currently, right now, I reside in Baltimore, Maryland, and that's where I am. And so, in addition to that, I'm an award-winning entrepreneur. Um, my entity, Burke Rose Exchange, which is in Baltimore, has been funded by Meta at this point, aka Facebook, American Express, iPhone Women, Comcast, BGE, and the list goes on. And so when I'm not doing that, <laughs> running a business and trying to be fabulous, I am also on the stages of some really big conferences. So by Southwest uh, in Austin. So it's a mega conference where some of your biggest um, idols have probably presented there. So think Barack Obama or even Elon Musk. I've also presented at Tech Inclusion in, no in, in New York. And so to kind of kind of talk about metaverse technology. So that's why you're here. That's why you should listen to me. And I have a lot of great stuff to share with you today. So a lot of people are saying, okay, the metaverse what is it? It's taking off. Um, but a lot of people still don't know what it is. And so I like to describe it in some very simple ways. The, the simplest way I'll describe it is having events or going to events in virtual spaces. That's the most popular use for it. But there are some other uses as well. And so when you start thinking about elements of the metaverse, it's literally all of these things. So when you start thinking about digital currency, all your crypto, so your Bitcoin, your Solana, your Ethereum, um, that's all a part of the, the, the metaverse. You got marketplace, digital commerce, you got NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which has taken over the world. People have been made millionaires and billionaires from this technology. We'll talk a little bit about it here, but not too much. Uh, infrastructure, device independence, gaming. So for those of you who are familiar with Fortnite, Roblox, you are already in the metaverse. Digital assets, some people have already attended concerts, social events, entertainment. And so at my entity in Burke Rose Exchange, this is the area that we pretty much dominate in as far as uh, social events and entertainment events in, in virtual reality for our clients and you know people who want to come learn about the metaverse, kind of like you, small business owners. So there's also online shopping, workplace, social media, digital humans. And so I don't want to get you all wrapped up around the language of this last one, which is natural language processing, which is simply Siri, Alexa, all the um, all the, the the platforms where you can talk and you get responses back, right? And so. I want to talk about virtual reality. So this is probably one of the best use cases for the metaverse. And so it's bringing your digital self, your digital human, your avatar into a virtual reality space, event space, whatever, where you can interact with other users who are there also as their avatars. And a really cool thing in the advancement of the technology has allowed avatars to almost look exactly like you. And so in this particular platform, Spatial, you can upload a picture of yourself. It pastes your photo or your face, I should say, on an avatar and it tries to match your skin. And so when you talk about um, 
inclusion, right? When you talk about inclusion, this technology didn't exist five or six years ago when I was working at USA Today, but it exists now. And so really conquering some of those DE&I concerns of technology many, many years ago, they found solutions. So this is one example of metaverse technology, which is VR, AKA virtual reality. So many moons ago in 2016, you had people risking their lives for trying to catch them all for Pokemon Go, right? And so this was a really famous and um, popular game around the globe. And so that summer, 2016, this was the mix of augmented reality. So basically you would take your phone, most people would have their phones at the time, would walk around the city trying to catch these little, um, these little furry animals, right? <laughs> like how, how you would in the actual game Pokemon. And so it laid, uh, virtual art, I guess you could say, virtual art on top of real life streets, real life streets, real life parks. And so it was tied to GPS technology. And so some people were actually getting hurt, unfortunately, but it was a really popular game. So this is just an example of augmented reality where you're taking something that doesn't exist and you're putting it in the real physical world to interact with it. This was a really big game, like I said, and gamification is our... Um, a really big use case when it comes to metaverse technology. And then you have what they like to call mixed reality, which is MR or XR, depending on who you're talking to. And so I think this is a really great example of how to pull the virtual world with the, the physical world. And so what's happening here in this example is that you have two avatars. These are two people who are meeting in their headsets somewhere around the world. And so someone is sharing their physical desktop inside the workroom. And so imagine this being a team meeting where instead of them being on Zoom, everyone comes as a little cute avatar, you, you know, that represents you and you're discussing whatever this presentation is, right? Or whatever the dashboard is. And so being able to find ways to liven up mundane meetings <laughs> and tasks and make it fun in some way. So I like this example a whole lot because Facebook went even farther than just allowing people to come as their avatars and to be able to share their screens. They've also added, if someone doesn't have a headset, that they can get access to the room through um, a web-based technology, a web-enabled technology where you would get a link and then you can watch from your computer. And so making sure that no one gets left behind so you're tackling the digital divide here. And that's what I think is really exciting uh, and, and, and inspiring. I guess that's the better words too, that these technology companies are starting to take in consideration that most people probably won't have the headsets or they can't afford the headsets. So how can you bring as many people as possible? And so a lot of the platforms have included web enabled technology so that you can get on with your phone. And then if some of them have gone even further than that, where you can now use your phone <laughs> to get on these platforms to engage. And so now there is no reason why anyone cannot get on the platform and be involved. So I know a lot of people are asking, you know, how do I make my place in the metaverse? How can I become a part of it? How can I bring my business to the metaverse and start really doing some things to really figure out what's the next generation of what I'm doing in my business? And so I want to just share with you some jobs, right? And so not jobs as in like nine to five, even though they could be, but also this is very applicable to people who have businesses, right? And so I'm gonna talk about each one of these because I think it's really important. When you have a lot of people who are creating content on uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, uh, you have all these people. So your models, uh, your artists, your writers, your videographer, fashion designers, they're all making assets of some kind. And so in the metaverse, there's a lot of opportunity for people who are creating virtual assets. And so this might sound crazy, but I'll talk about an example later where Nike started developing virtual shoes, right? And so people are like, wait, what? <laughs> who would need virtual shoes? And everyone's gonna need virtual shoes at some point. So think about everything that you have in real life, there will be some equivalent to it in the metaverse. And I know it sounds crazy. And so even in that example, I remember sharing with one of my friends who's a sneakerhead that uh, Nike worked with another company to create skin for your shoes that change, I don't know, every so often. And so she lost her mind, right? She lost her mind with the idea that she could buy one pair of virtual sneakers for her avatar. And depending on like what 
capsule, I think that's what they were calling it, what capsule she purchased that she can get certain skins for her shoes. So it's almost like having, let's just say the capsule had five different skins, right? So you can have like a red skin, a blue skin, a purple skin, a gold skin, or a white skin for your shoes. And so it changes the look and the appearance of it. And so for most people, they're like, oh my God, why would people pay for it? Well, don't worry about why they would pay for it. Just know that they already have, right? So there's a lot of money and opportunity um, to be made and to had to be had in the in the metaverse. And so think about that from a creator standpoint, especially if you're a musician, you're a writer, you're a videographer, like how you can bring your work and how you can actually up level what you're doing, either for yourself or other businesses or even just regular consumers. And so another really great example here is um, Balenciaga partner with Fortnite and they made clothing for the, the users. So the users are going around shooting people in Balenciaga luxury clothing skin. <laughs> so just imagine if you are a clothing designer or maker that you could literally be, be designing virtual clothes for people's avatars to walk around the metaverse. And so hopefully that starts giving you some ideas, all of you creators out there, what you could be doing specifically in the metaverse, either as a job or for your business. Now, when it comes to community, this is super huge and really important because this is probably the most important cornerstone of the metaverse is that people are looking for a place for expression and community, right? Connection. And so it's a really great way uh, when you focus on community to attract and engage and help either your customers, your clients, your audience, your, your super fans. And so really thinking about how you could be leveraging these metaverse spaces to build that community. And so, you know, all the people that are listed under here, your evangelists, your marketers, customer support, curators, influencers, moderators, and advisors. And so in any community, you always need people to moderate, right? Uh, one of the most popular, I guess you could say messaging systems within the metaverse is called Discord. So you'll find a lot of people who are moderators there, moderating Discord groups and conversations, things like that. Um, you have people who are in the marketing space, right? And so marketers are trying to build community. And so corporations are actually spending a lot of money trying to figure out what their metaverse strategy is. And so if they're spending money finding ways to get in, I definitely want you to start thinking about how you can start building community. And then you have builders. So these are the people who are designing, organizing experiences. And so at Brick Rose Exchange, we kind of fall in this builder space. And so um, I've managed game developers before. I have a community of web builders, that world builders, I should say, that I'm connected to. So these are people who are going into the central land, sandbox, Roblox, uh, Horizon Worlds, which is owned by Facebook, and even spatial and building out spaces and worlds for people to interact, buy things, and just a whole lot of stuff, right? So you got uh, producers and presarios, uh, curriculum designers, storytellers, and generous organizers. And so I really want you to start thinking that if you're any of these people who are doing these types of things where you're building things, uh, building experiences, building curriculum, um, telling stories, building stories, really figuring out how you can bring your skill set within the metaverse and start designing and organizing experiences. When it comes to participants, these are your everyday people, right? So they come there to explore, learn, and engage. Um, and right now, Burke Rose is starting to move into this space where we're creating something called a DAO, which is considered like a, um, a group, right? A membership group or some kind, you give them some type of um, governance, right, where they can make decisions. And so you start thinking about how you want your participants to start interacting with you or if you're even a participant somewhere else. So, you know, uh, customizers, guild leaders, traders, spectators, modders. And so just thinking about beyond just building a community, how else are you going to get people to participate in it? Then you got the bridgers, right? So these are the people who are connecting the physical world to the virtual world. So you have historians, um, digital twin implementers, naturalists, data providers, analysts, um, public health, safety. So these are people who are doing a lot of like research. <laughs> so if you are that person when it comes to like data analysis, this is the perfect space for you of really figuring out what makes 
um, the best connection between that physical and virtual world. And so even this last one that I have here, the performers, so all of the people who are doing acting, musicians, guys, streamers, re, you know, um, YouTubers, teachers, leaders, and coaches, and you are creating real-time content. And so if that's you, there is tons of opportunities here for you in the metaverse. And so I hope that that really helped to break down how you can start seeing what you do every, every day, day to day, either in, at work or even in your business, how you can really start getting into the metaverse. So I know that was a lot of information, but hopefully you took some really great notes of how to move forward. So I wanted to share with y'all this story about this young artist, right? And so I really want to hone in on the importance of protecting your IP. And so for most people who are new to the metaverse and all the technology and uses, uh, this young lady is probably a really good learning example. So I just want to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. So this not young artist, she was the lead designer for one of the most popular and successful NFT collection launches have to date, right? And so if you're familiar with the Board 8 Club, these are some of her early sketches of the virtual work that you see. And so for those of you who have seen people post um, as their random profile pics apes, <laughs> this is the start. She started this work. And so what wound up happening, unfortunately, was that she didn't really understand NFTs and how they were going to be working with them. And she didn't go into too much detail in this particular article, but you can go look for it. It was in Rolling Stone. It was in Rolling Stone in um, January 2022. And so she kind of hinted towards how they used her work and she was compensated for her work, but she wasn't included in the royalties of the actual sale of the digital work, right? So what I mean is <clears throat> they use her work as a base, but anything that happened um, beyond her um, base pay, or, or she wasn't entitled to any royalties. And so that's one of the most important and probably the most lucrative and sexy and attractive things about NFTs is that when you write smart contracts, you can write them in a way that with every sale, there's some type of royalty back to you, right? Royalty in the mean of you get paid in perpetuity. I think that's the simplest way that I can explain it. And so just think about you creating something or at least a framework for it. Like you're almost like the architect and especially when it's new technology and you're just really excited to work on something really new and innovative, but you don't understand the technology behind it and how it has immense earning potential, right? And of course, at the time, no one else had done it. And so she probably didn't even think to ask those questions. She probably didn't even think about going to an attorney to like really talk about the the application of it and what would happen next and so unfortunately she wrote this article she didn't really go into too many details because I guess she was still under like NDA or whatever but basically you know the the sentiment was is that she didn't really get compensated beside but beyond um what she got compensated for by just providing these sketches and so I think this is a really good warning lesson for anyone who's new who's trying to get into the space it's just you know, protect your IP, right? Find ways to trademark your things, um, to copyright it, whatever you can do. And also talk about future royalties on your work. And so if Beyonce didn't teach us anything about homecoming uh, and that whole Netflix, was it Netflix that she sold it to? I think a lot of people were upset at first when they learned that she didn't get paid as much as Ariana Grande for her performance. What people didn't know was on the back end, Queen B sold her content <laughs> into Netflix. And so now she set up a whole situation where she gets paid in perpetuity, right? And so as long as they, they show it. And so this is kind of like that same, I want to make sure like there's a, a similar type of thread here that people get is that, and we're past the point now, I think as entrepreneurs of one-time pay, we should really be looking at how can we get paid not always in perpetuity, but, you know, multiple times over and over again. So don't quote me on the, the Queen Bee stuff, but basically she got paid more than once. <laughs> so let's go and move forward to the next example. So I mentioned this earlier, 
when I talked about virtual shoes, right? And so Nike was the first one in the game of the corporate the, the corporations to really jump in and say, you know what, we want to make these digital shoes. And so when I saw, I was like, oh, they are so smart. <laughs> they are really smart. And so they went a step further. So when we just talked about protecting your IP, Nike was not playing any games with anybody. And so they put a trademark on their virtual goods. And so right now the the court case is still being decided as of this recording, but there was a store, um, some online store that basically made virtual Nikes. And so Nike is testing out their trademark <laughs> and they're testing out their trademark uh, to see whether or not they can get the store to take down the shoes and if there's any other ramifications with it, right? And so I want you to start thinking about one, if you're a creator, how can you start bringing some of your original work within the metaverse? But also don't forget the part of copywriting and trademarking and whatever you can do. I know that there's been a lot of conversation around TikTok dances, right? Um, TikTok dancers starting to protect their work because other people would copy, copy their dances and make millions off of it, whereas sometimes they weren't being credited. And so I'm going to encourage you to do the same thing all you creators out there as you start thinking about how to bring your creations in the metaverse figure out also um, ways to talk to ip attorneys to to protect whatever you can um, before you bring it there or have the right agreements in place so that people can't rip you off so i just wanted to see that the other thing that i wanted to say about this particular slide was is that as you can see they're hiring designers so if you don't desire to create your own store and your own brand, you're going to go work for some of these big guys like Nike uh, and Balenciaga and go start designing virtual clothes for avatars. And so I just want to let you know like how big this is. There was an article that I was reading where um, there was someone who purchased, it was a, a tiara and then there was a handbag. I think the tiara was $400,000. I think the handbag might've been 3,000 or it might've been the other way, I'm not sure. Either way, both goods are not real, right? Like they're virtual goods. And so to think that anyone would spend even $3,000 on something that they can't even physically touch, right? Or that they would even consider paying $400,000 for something that they can't physically touch. I wanna encourage you to do this. Don't worry about, why they would do it, just know that it's being done. <laughs> so don't get hung up on the why they're doing it, just know it's being done. There are people who are buying these things. And so even if you are not the person, there is someone who is. And so kind of think about it like that. What are the possibilities for you and your brand and your company uh, for you to bring your work, to bring your business uh, into the metaverse? This is a really cool example um, of a young man, a young man who basically did most of this work himself. And so I'll try to talk at this at a very high general level. So he made something called an NFT jacket, right? And so it's a physical, not physical, it's a virtual jacket that your avatar can wear in the in 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 um, the metaverse platform. So the one example that I have, I have a friend who's in the central land. She bought one of these jackets as an NFT and you get access to like training classes, course material, I think like his community. And then you get to walk around in virtual reality in the metaverse with this jacket on. And so it gives people uh, information. It's almost like a marketing billboard in a sense on the back of the jacket, there's a website that sends people back to his community. And so even thinking about for all of you out there who are doing training, coaching or whatever, NFTs don't always have to be a picture, right? Like there could be some type of utility, that's what they call it, utility to it where it gives people access to something. And so you have organizations like Blavity with uh, Afrotech and some of their split off Afrotech events where they're starting to give access to people to NFTs. And so I just want you to start thinking about everything that you go to that's ticketed, everything that's a membership, uh, how can you start bringing people into your communities with NFTs, with tokens? And so I don't wanna to go too deep into that because you're like tokens, NFTs, what's that? We can talk about that at a later date, but just know that NFTs are starting to hit like what I like to call this second generation, a more usability, where it's not that, you know, the weird picture, you're like, oh, what do you do with that? 
people pay $400,000 $400, for a picture, some people have. But now it's starting to come with utility where you can access spaces. And I can tell you for Brick Rose specifically, we're about to roll out a membership program that's based on tokens. So we have a physical building in Baltimore that has three spaces. I like to call them activation spaces. Um, one part is meeting space. The other part is VR um, podcast studio. And then the other part is wellness retreat loft. And so our members here at Brick Rose will be able to access the spaces through their token membership. And so I'm really excited about that um, because one of the biggest problems that for anyone who runs membership programs know that you run into churn. And so real quick, I'll explain what churn is. Churn is when you lose members, right? <laughs> so very simply. And so for anyone who has a membership program, that's the biggest concern that you have, or even if you have software program, um, churn of losing customers. And so using tokens and NFTs are actually a way that you kind of minimize the risk that you have with churn. So I won't, that's it for right now for churn. <laughs> I know it's a weird word. And so I want to just kind of talk a little bit about investing because this is for the person who's just like, all right, Bianca, I don't want to be any of those things <laughs> that you put for jobs in the metaverse. I don't have a business. I don't have a product. Like I just want to make money. And one gentleman actually said to me one time, he said to me, he was like, I just want to be the guy that sells shovels in the gold rush, right? So for those of you who are aware or know of the gold rush, the gold rush is when um, a lot of people in on the east side of the country started to migrate west and they went there in hopes of finding gold. And so people became millionaires just by selling shovels, right? And so selling the tools that people would need to dig out in west. And so I would liken or, you know, compare investing to selling the shovels in the gold rush. So how do you invest in the metaverse? And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what you could be doing some organizations, I shouldn't say organizations, some companies that you should be looking at or, you know, just kind of peek and gander at because there's hundreds, if not thousands of them already. And so I'm going to mention um, kind of like these three examples. First, for those of you who thought Facebook was the metaverse, <laughs> that's what they wanted you to believe. They actually acquired the company that they have all the technology. They own the rights to the technology now back in 2014. So they had been planning this almost eight years ago. They bought the company Oculus for $2.3 billion. And I remember going to uh, the conference in San Diego. So they normally call it OC one, two, three, or four. So I actually went to four in what year was this? 2018, I think it was. Yeah, 2018. And so at that conference, they had nothing but Facebook employees doing a presentation. So over the years, they started to adopt and reimagine the technology that that company had already built. And so you'll actually start seeing uh, Oculus um, Oculus Quest be rebranded to MetaQuest. And so they've actually already started putting out some of the, um, the branding and the advertising. And soon, uh, Oculus, their brand name won't be so forward-facing forward facing and recognizable. And so I just wanted to say that because Oculus and the, the technology that they put out was really revolutionary for the virtual reality industry. And so with Facebook acquiring the company, it really gave them the, the head start, the, the major head start that they needed to when they made the official name change as of last year. So that's the first thing, right? So companies you want to look at, whether you love them or hate them, look at Facebook <laughs> and pay attention to what they're doing um, in the VR metaverse space. I'm not, this is not advice to go buy the stock. I'm just saying pay attention to what they do. Uh, the second thing is Sony. Sony actually went out and purchased the game studio. Now, I'm going to tell you a quick story. At USA Today, when I worked there at 2016, I actually managed a game dev a, a team of game developers, right, as well as some other IT people. And at the time, I'm pretty sure most people thought USA Today was crazy. Why would you hire a team of game developers? What they didn't know at the time was that the game developer team was an R&D team. And so we built <laughs> some of our first products and some of the first products that people saw in the media space in-house, whereas other media companies had to hire studios 
well, we didn't have that problem. We didn't have studios where we had to pay a whole bunch of money to. And also we didn't have the time delays that you would have in working with an outside entity. So because everything was in house, we were able to ideate, we were able to share ideas. We were able to kind of storyboard and like really design the experience in a way or the experiences because we actually built three on why I was there in house. And so actually the last one that we built, and I think I mentioned this before, actually won a Pulitzer. And so I say all of that because these other companies that are now starting to get the importance of buying game studios, take Sony and take Microsoft. So Sony purchased a game studio called Bungie for $3.6 billion. <laughs> this happened, I want to say, probably earlier first quarter of 2022. So somewhere maybe between January and March or so. And so now they have a game studio. And guess what Microsoft did? They went and bought a game studio too. <laughs> so they bought a studio called Activision Blizzard and they paid way more money. So $68 billion. And so uh, these are two companies also that I think you should pay attention to, Sony and Microsoft. I can tell you specifically for Microsoft, they have a contract with the, fe not the federal government, with the government through military. So they have a military contract um, they, they will be using um, the HoloLens headsets. So they have their own headsets. And so the government will be training with those headsets. And so I'm assuming, this is my own assumption, that the game studio will probably be designing experiences for Microsoft to be able to serve some of their big clients like the, um, the military. And so you can see how this is all starting to come together, right? And probably a couple of years ago, Microsoft and Sony probably couldn't justify uh, buying a game studio, but now with the metaverse as crazy and as big as it is, it makes sense to the average person. You know, USA Today was just way before its time. And so uh, we racked up some really great awards because, you know, we were ahead of our time. Um, some other personal investments for everyday people, right? I think um, a lot of times people ask me about virtual real estate. And so uh, it's a very lucrative thing, <laughs> but you gotta have the coins for it. So like this example, right? So Sandbox, they, um, I wanna say this was probably like around March. I'm not sure what the value of Sandbox is right now, the parcels, but you gotta pay attention to all the lands. Someone paid $17,000. <laughs> for virtual land and that's nothing someone actually paid over four hundred thousand dollars to have plot next to snoop and um what what was it sandbox yeah i think it was sandbox and so i just want people to understand like it sounds good <laughs> in theory to say i'm gonna buy some virtual land first of all you got to know what a parcel is, how many parcels, what that looks like, what you're going to do with the land. And so people are making some money. I was reading an article probably last week where um, agencies are buying virtual land and they're charging big brands upwards of $60,000 to use their land to hold their events, right? They're building entities on the, the land and then charging them. And so there's tons of opportunities. There's tons of companies and I think uh, maybe I'll put, uh, there's this metaverse market map that I have, and maybe I'll put that up in my booth where you can see hundreds of companies that are already in the metaverse landscape so that you can kind of get some ideas from a personal investment standpoint and also potentially a career standpoint. Like you may see a company on there that you didn't know was already in the metaverse. And if you want to work for them, you can probably, you know, go to, go to the website and check it out. But I think that it's really important um, to really understand that there's multiple ways to get in. So if you're a service-based business, there's a place for you in the metaverse. If you're a product-based business, there's a place for you in the metaverse. If you don't want to bring any of your businesses <laughs> or you don't want to work for anybody, there's ways that you can make money off of the different decisions corporations are making with their money to either, you know, acquire and merge and things like that. So I just want you to kind of have some options here of what you could be doing. I think this is really important and I'll, I'll be completely straight up with you. This technology is not new. <laughs> it's really not. It's been around for a good chunk of time. And so the industry, the VR industry and the AR industry was, this is before it, be rebrand, before it was rebranded to Metaverse. They were really betting. That's the right word. They were really betting on taking off in 2016, 2017. And it didn't. And I'm going to be straight up with y'all. It didn't because 
one, it was for white boys. It really was. And so what I mean by that is um, normally at the time, there were a lot of white men who were gamers, right? And so gamers in the sense of they had $600 plus headsets. They had $2,000 plus supercomputers. And you're almost talking about $3,000 in, in, in just hardware alone, right? Not even the, the different experiences and games that you had to download and some were um, some cost and some were free. But at that time, people like you and me was like, oh, this is cute. <laughs> this is a real cute gimmick. But like this, I can't justify spending $26 hundred or three thousand dollars on this equipment to play games right and so what has happened over the years is that one as they've made it more web enabled and accessible there's been more use cases cutting down the digital device of being able to get on with your computer being able to get on your phone and so a, a lot more people now have access right now they have access now they can add to the ecosystem they can start changing how some of these platforms are moving and one great example and this is the best example um, of a platform who has really listened to their users is spatial and so spatial s-p-a-t-i-a-l.io um, that is the name of the organization and so it's the platform that we introduce anyone that we come to we come across on the platform right so going there, they listened to their users and when they and um, made it wait well, when they made it web enabled, they saw the user base grow exponentially around the world. They started to see that people were no longer just coming there for work and work meetings, that they were doing cultural things. And, you know, we bring culture wherever we go, right? And so they were doing art exhibits, they were um, you know, showing off their NFTs. They were doing uh, cultural gatherings. So there's one experience there where it's like Chinese New Year's, like we, we were bringing all of the culture, right? And so I think that it's really important as you listen, <laughs> as you listen here and you start to think about how you want to get into the metaverse, this is an old projection. This projection, um, who did it come from? I don't even know, but the new one is from JP Morgan Chase. It's not even 800 billion anymore. It's now 1 trillion. That is trillion with a T. I'm not sure about you, but I don't even know what a trillion dollars looks like, right? So it's 1 trillion by 2024. And guess when, the, as of the date of this recording, that's in two years. And so y'all can play around if you want to. I won't. <laughs> and so I'm trying to help as many people as possible really get on the train, the boat, whatever it is that you need to get on this time. Because like I said before, they expected this to pop in 2017, 2000, 2016, 2017, six, five, six years ago, right? And it didn't. Now with COVID uh, being, you know, shutting down the world, the need for a global, uh, not global, the need for internet virtual experiences and they've taken it further beyond zoom to virtual reality experiences experiences in the metaverse culture experiences that you can now access people from all over the world oh people are gonna miss this boat don't let it be you right and so i'm driving a boat <laughs> there's a lot of people driving a boat in their own trains into the metaverse especially for people who look like us make sure you get on one of them because this isn't going to stop. It's only, only going to continue to grow. And I think, unfortunately, with, the, with COVID and the, the pandemic, you've seen the need for technology. And a lot of people have tried to do business without it. Huh. <laughs> Don't make that mistake. And so I just want to make sure that you get caught up somewhere. So make sure you come by the booth, come check out the information that you have. And at the very least that I want you to do, even if you don't come to the booth, just Google Metaverse Plus, whatever it is that you do so that you can get some inspiration. You can get some motivation for what you do or what you could be doing in the Metaverse. And so I actually have a class where I teach people and I show them what big brands and small brands are doing in the Metaverse to kind of give you that um, motivation and that inspiration that you may be looking for and what you may need or just kind of being trying to be a guide for you. And then in addition to the training and kind of working through some of your questions, we actually go on a tour. So we go on a tour in my Metaverse space and some of the environments that we have that our clients have done events in, you know, I've met with their teams things like that. So come check that out if you have an opportunity to. And yeah, so I just talked about training class. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And so if you have questions, <laughs> please come to the booth. 
and ask your questions, leave your questions there, send us an email, uh, follow us on Instagram, but whatever you need to do, just make sure you don't get left um, because there won't be another <laughs> takeoff of the metaverse. This is pretty much it.